so there could be that negotiation. So I um, just wanted to mention that out there because she and I talked and said, what is the word? I said, <laughs> she said, you need to tell everybody that term. Because I said, I can think of it in Hmong, but I can't think of it in English. Because in Hmong, we call it you know, you know, when we're all in the same space, we need to do that. So that collaboration or that negotiation could happen. So um, just letting go of that power. I also wanted to comment on the middle, middle way thing. Um, going back to my identity uh, presentation with Tori, uh, I talked about wearing different hats and keeping a balance of the different hats that I have to wear, um, whether I'm at home or I'm at work or in situations like this where I have to kind of balance both in trying to present who I really am. And when I'm out in my work environment, I might be at a work function and I have my work hat on, my American hat, and I don't think about who I am as a Hmong person, but I think of myself as an American person, of what my functions are, who, who I am to be, and what I am to be, to fit into that situation to make it, you know, to make it work. I'm at home, I think about what I have to do. When I get home, I think about what I need to do as a home person because my parents are very very traditional and so I I still we still speak about sixty percent of money at home. Um, and so we I still have to keep that balance whether I am at home or at work or in situations like this I always have to keep my different hats available so I can, you know, switch easily. I'm um, thinking in your presentation, you said this all pretty much started with an act of racism. Um, most of my experiences are from uh, Fox Alley, and I notice a lot of subtle racism. Is it your experience here that there's a lot more over racism? Um, I, I lived here in Stevens Point for about 27, 25 years probably. And um, as a child growing up, I didn't really recognize the racism until I got into um, middle school and I started hearing these comments. Um, and so, in school, I, I, I noticed it a lot more than in the outside community. So, um, yeah, there, there were some some of that. And so, into high school, there was quite a bit of um, drama with the different uh, groups. And so, because the Hmong community had grown so fast in those last four years that you know, there was such a fear, especially in the grade from the middle school and the high school levels, that the, the racism was very, very apparent. And I would add to that, I mean, we talked about the chicken story as the origin story, but there was actually a lot. I'd grown up here, moved away, and moved back, um, and experienced overt and just very sort of casual racism where people would tell you, repeat these sort of stereotypes or stories in just bizarre contexts. Like we were buying a house and, and there's a banker who's trying to get our business and is telling me, and I, I have no idea what triggered it. It was just sort of these unsolicited stories of, um, you know, these sort of stereotypes from who knows where they came from. Um, and so that, you know, that it wasn't just the chickens, it was sort of building this, like, this experience I was having in my, my home community where it was, I, it was insane to me that this would be sort of, um, sort of overt or covert, it was just so casual. I mean, I think that was the part that people would kind of offer these stories and I wasn't sure, you know, what, what the purpose of them was and that, you know, there were stories that were, you know, that hurt people, and just kind of bizarre. You know, that, was, that was a lot of where I was coming from on a personal level. I was triggered by the change. Kind of a, a so I think it, I mean I think it's obviously still and then kind of getting back to the whole idea of like well where do you have these interactions and that's kind of what we wanted to discover because I also didn't have a lot of personal connection or experience with the Hmong community so um, this 
is there a vehicle for me to help do that? But then um, maybe, maybe a little, little bit of a vehicle for other people to do this. I didn't see the film. Does, it looks like it might be online, is that true? Or, um, it has, um, it showed up, monvideo.org. It will be posted on the website eventually. Uh, pretty soon it'll be on there. The, we do have another showing um, here this weekend at the Cultural Fest. Um, we'll be showing it twice, I think at 11 and 2, so you can catch it there. Okay. It'll be online shortly thereafter, and it'll also, uh, it'll also be in the library. We've been holding off to try and get people to come to the showings. But, so after this weekend, it'll be, it'll be available in the library. Okay, well, that's good to know that it's at the Cultural Festival. Um, and Tori, I have worked with empowerment issues and racial issues in the South East Valley for 12 years. And so, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about the water race. That's awesome. But um, that was uh, my particular interest in the Hmong community. If there are ways to uh, help or assist and engage in anything that uh, does deal with racial issues or empowerment issues of the Hmong community. So one, one reaction I have to that, and, and because I'm an anthropologist and I teach anthropology courses and, and introductory anthropology courses, I spend a lot of time talking about race and racism. And one of the things that we need to be doing is white people need to be talking to white people about white privilege, about power, and about racism. Instead of always shuffling it off to the people who don't have power to correct the problem. So that's my first reaction. White people need to talk to them. Yeah. Uh, you talked a little bit before about the assimilation of your you know, cultures. Um, I might be a little bit wrong here, but uh, the Hmong language wasn't come around as far as being written until like, I believe late, late 1800s. Is there any effort being made to write down the oral traditions and history of the Hmong culture? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I mean, there, and that's very, uh, there's a lot of research out there that says that there, there's always been a language. Um, and, and there's a lot of talk about the written language too, what it used to look like. Um, some people say, some of the scholars will say that in, the Hmong language would look a lot like Chinese characters. They were characters. Um, and then until uh, until the Hmong king was killed and then the Hmong country was taken over. And um, since that time, there hasn't been a Hmong country. So um, among our people, we've had a common country, indigenous groups of sorts. And um, so, but yes, there is, there are efforts to, there, there's definitely written work out there. Um, not all of it is, because there's, there's such a long period where there wasn't really anything written, that there are people who are, may tell slightly different stories about how the Hmong people came to you, who the Hmong people are. But yes, there, there are books. I think the Dean is uh, suggesting that we... No, oh. I, just, I just have a question really that falls right out when you're asking there. Um, have you thought of doing a continuing education course in colloquial Hmong? I mean, just Hmong that I could just speak with you say hello in the morning when I see you on the campus. Um, I think that would go a long ways to start to build bridges because I know that I knew nothing about German culture until I took German in high school. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly I started learning about culture. So if we could come up with a way to even have um, even a life uh, section, you know, the life a group that does that, do some colloquial Hmong, to learn some Hmong sayings, I think it would go a long ways for building some bridges because I knew nothing. I, I, can't, I can't even say hello to you in Hmong. And that kind of hurts me. So I think it's a good thing to look into. Um, as part of the Portage uh, County Culture Festival, I've been asked to do something like that. And so uh, this Saturday, I have a room reserved for, it's only 30 minutes, but it's at, um, it's at 2 o'clock, I believe. Yes. And so you can look for it, and I'll be there. Sounds good. We may put you in touch with our team. We got Sure. Actually, um, a couple of different times, the Hostel students taught uh, colloquial Hmong uh, for free on campus, open to anybody. And we had we had a quite diverse group of uh, people that came. Some of them were Hmong students, some were teachers' aides, uh, some were just you know, community people that were interested. And um, we we did that a couple of times over the years. But I think the students.
things that we have now would not be able to do that. Their mom is not strong enough where they need it. With, with each generation, it's amazing. Yes. And many of you can identify. Yes, my parents. It's, it's amazing what you lose. Five of your children? No, they do not. <laughs> but they, they do understand. And, um, it's, it's really hard to really get them to, to really speak it because, like Lacey mentioned earlier, I mean, once my, my kids were speaking mom from the day they were born until four years old. Once they went, to, uh, you know, going to pre, pre K, they started speaking English and they refused to, to speak mom. And so I don't know what, what happened when they went to school, but um, yeah. They do understand the language, but unfortunately, they won't speak it. So it does have to just keep speaking it. Okay. Do you do a summer course and talk the language and culture? I do. I do. Yeah. I have. Yes, I do teach Hmong 101 and 102. For the most part, it was intended, well, originally, it was intended for um, practicing teachers. Um, to come back uh, as part of their ESL certification. So I still get those, and especially, I get uh, quite a few, especially from the Wausau area, because the Wausau School District uh, requires that their teachers um, have that sort of license. So um, I get quite a few from there, but now there's really not quite as many student um, teachers, but having said that, um, I still get them, not as much as there used to be. Um, on occasion, I do get some other professionals, um, in the health field, in the business field, who take my course, so yes. So mostly to, I teach, um, 101 and 102 is mostly to non Hmong speaking um, native speakers. Um, and more recently, I've actually been, I've actually had some Hmong students who, like we said, cannot speak Hmong. So I've been, I, I've had quite a few of them, and it seems like an increasing number of them. So yes, I do. Mm -hmm. No, it's not surprising at all. Um, and there's kind of a reclaiming, you know, wanting to reclaim the culture and the language and feeling like, as you said, um, uh, you know, there's a sense of, I wish that my parents would have made me more. Um, so maybe just keep speaking to them. <laughs> They'll be thankful one day. There are more questions than one. So you say that people wonder kind of because of the language that I think it's more all oh, everyone's trying to reclaim their language because my parents don't know Spanish, my grandparents do. Now my generation is trying to learn it. Could it, could it be that everyone's just trying to learn the language again? Sure. And I mean, and I guess it's simply say the Hmong are no different then. You know, there um, there are many groups who are people who are trying to do that. And you know, there's something I don't know the research, but there is research that shows that. Especially with some generations, there is this need to reclaim um, culture and language, you know, some kind, to learn more about it. So, more than just one last question. One last question. We've done a wonderful presentation and a wonderful film. And I think we built a lot of trust. We've really laid some groundwork here. So, where are you going to take it from here? What's the next step? What's the future of this project? Or what's step two? Well, I, I think one neat thing that we're doing, I don't know anything about it, but this project that we're doing with the youth um, documentary filming, and that's in the works. Oh, we're just trying to get more, uh, trying to cultivate more among filmmakers. Exactly. Yeah. Because we reached sort of a, I mean, library's closing. <laughs> Yep. There's only sort of so far we can get sort of given, you know, where we were coming from and kind of uh, everything, everything that it took to get this far. So I think the next uh, project, be it a video project or whatever it is, would be, uh, yeah, I'm hoping that there'll be uh, a wrong director for that. I'll have to talk to you. I want to thank uh, Tori and Macy and everyone else involved in the project. If you have more questions, please feel free to interact with them up front. They will be closing the library, but you can always get out of here. <laughs>